Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to be able to share the word with you. Let's begin by bowing our heads in prayer. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you are. We pray that this morning you'll open up the scriptures so that we can see you clearly, that we can grow in our love and our devotion to you. Lord, help us to see you. Help us to know you. Help us to reflect you. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever stopped and considered what the goal of the Christian life is? I mean, why do we live the lives we live? Why do we come week after week and we attend church? I mean, it's a bit of an inconvenience, isn't it? Why do we read our Bibles? Why do we spend time in prayer? Why do we sacrifice our time and our resources? We could go on and on and all the things that we do in the Christian life. But why is it that we do these things? Do we do it because we are Christians? And that's just what Christians do. Or is it something more? All these things need to be working together towards an ultimate goal. And what is our ultimate goal? It must be. It must be to know God. All these things that we do ought to move us closer to God. He is our ultimate end. So with this in mind, this morning we shall start a new series. A series on the attributes of God, on who God is. So let's ask ourselves some diagnostic questions, some things to think about, and we shall return to these questions again and again throughout the series. Do you know God? What is this God like? How well do you know God? Is he like us? How is it that you know God? And is your view of God the same as the view of God that's in the Bible? Now, unless we know who God is, we cannot understand his works. We cannot understand why he does the things he does, why we are supposed to respond the way we are. There is no reason for God to send his son unless we understand the love of God. There's no reason for the death of Christ unless we understand that God is righteous and holy. There's no reason to trust God if we do not understand that he is good, true, and unchanging. Everything we know about Christianity is built on the foundation of the attributes of God. But you might ask, why would we spend time learning or having even a sermon series on the attributes of God? Don't we need something more practical, something that we need to do? I mean, does this really impact our lives? Does it impact the here and now? Or is this just head knowledge? Well, the knowledge of God is perhaps the most practical thing we as Christians could ever learn. As people could ever learn. The very truths of who God is impacts everything that we do. We could go to some of the many places in the scriptures in which we've been given instructions or commands, things that we are to do. And then we could read them and then we could just, out of obedience, go and do them. Now, I mean, that would be fine, I suppose. We could even throw in the motivation of love, but it still wouldn't be enough. But if we understand who God is, and then we live in light of who he is, we are living in faith. Our obedience becomes an act of faith. And we all know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. To quote A.W. Tozer, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. The way that we live 
shows what we really think about God. So if we were to consider the Christianity, the Christianity of much of the Western world, we would find a very shallow religion. They worship a weak, impotent God. For instance, think of the things that say the prosperity gospel preaches. Do this and God will bless you. All right? You have to do the work before anything happens. Or if we were to move a little bit closer to home, think of what the standard evangelical beliefs. Are we as Christians in this day, are we, are we known as people who are moved with awe by the might, the magnitude, and the magnificence of God? Or are we known as people who simply just tip the hat to God, a little add-on, we go to church, but perhaps beyond a couple of inconveniences, we are no different to the world. Is God to us like a, a little genie that we turn to when we're in trouble, when we need something, but when everything is fine, God is relegated back into his bottle and put on the shelf to gather dust? Or is God our greatest treasure? Let me ask you, do you have a big God? Do you have a God that presses upon all of your life? Or is your God simply an add-on? Something that is there. Most of the time you don't even think about God. Does not impact your everyday life. Doesn't impact what you do. Doesn't impact your devotion. Doesn't impact the way that you lead your family. But it's just there. You may call yourself a Christian. You may attend church regularly. Yet, you do not know this God. Now, as we consider some of these questions, you may know what the right answer is. And you might be able to say, yes, I do serve a big God. Yes, I do know who God is. But if we were to stop and take a step back and really reflect on our answers, think about where is it that we stand? So where do we start? We're going to start with, firstly, the greatness of God. I'm convinced that one of the greatest issues we have in understanding who God is, is that we think of him too little. We do not have a big God when we think of him. We need to lean into the understanding that God is a lot bigger than us and a lot bigger than we think he is. We need to be amazed at how immense God is. We need to see how great the Lord is. We read in Psalm 145, verse 3, Great is Yahweh, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. God is the God we can, ought to, and is worthy of our praise. And as we see here, he is full of greatness to the point that the psalmist describes him as unsearchable. This means we could spend a lifetime searching for the end of God's greatness and we would never find it. It is completely unfathomable. This is what God is like. That even his greatness knows no bounds. And as we will soon see, it is not just his greatness that is unsearchable, but all of God. This is no, what is known as the incomprehensibility of God. This means that we can never come to fully understand God. We can dig, we can dig and dig and never come to a full understanding of the depths of God. We can never comprehend God exhaustively. There will never ever come a time in our lives, and this is whether it be mortal or in eternity, in which we can ever say, I fully understand the greatness of God. It'll never happen. Now, this does not mean that we do not, we cannot have an accurate knowledge of God, or that God is unknowable, that he's just some kind of mystery. 
but this means that we cannot have a, a comprehensive, a full and a perfect knowledge of God. Now, why do we start here? We need to understand who God is, how utterly different he is to us. You see, God is not like a, a big man. He's not like a, a man that's magnified to a larger way. For instance, if we were to look at the, the mythologies of, let's say, the Greek gods, Zeus and, and whatnot, all you really see are more powerful versions of humanity. These are the big men and, and women, I suppose, as well. And in their stories, what do we see? We see that they bicker, they fight, they deceive one another, they sexually procreate. They have all the flaws, they are all the fighting, all the errors, even the virtues that men have. But they are simply magnified to the nth degree. They have more in common with the characters in a superhero story than with the true God. But when we boil it down, all of these gods are no different to us. They are a reflection of us. This is not what Yahweh, the true God, is like. He is so much bigger. He is so much more. In the scriptures, we see him being described as unsearchable, as indescribable, as incomprehensible in his greatness, his power, his works, his ways, his understanding, his wisdom, his knowledge, his judgment, his thoughts, his presence, and his years, just to name a few. To illustrate, Job 26, 14, Behold, these are the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Romans 11, 33 to 34. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Again in Job, Job 36, 26. Behold, God is great. And we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. And we could list scripture after scripture describing God as indescribable in some way, as unable to be comprehended. But what is it that makes God incomprehensible? It is because he is infinite. He is completely and totally limitless. Every aspect of him, every attribute, all of God. When we consider God, he cannot be contained. Our minds cannot conceive, our imaginations cannot comprehend, and our words cannot express the magnitude of God. Any aspect that we know of God, anything that we know of God is so small compared to the vastness of who he is. Anything we know of God is like a grain of sand on an ocean of sand in the desert. On the other hand, we are infant, we are finite. We have a beginning, we are limited. Now this is called the creator-creation distinction. And you see, even when we are glorified, we will still be limited. Even without our sin nature, we'll still be limited. We will still be cre creatures that God has made. Even the angels in heaven are still creatures who cannot comprehend God. Even in heaven, the greatness of God will be unsearchable. So God is bigger than our minds can comprehend. It is beyond the human ability to fathom. And in this, we must grow and heart of wonder and awe in light of his incomprehensible, incomprehensible greatness. The Lord says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9. This means we can never know everything there is to know about God. Not even a single aspect of his person. Not a single part of his work. We could spend all of eternity concentrated on one thing. We could say, spend all of eternity learning about the love of God. And we would never, ever 
in eternity, find the end of it. There would be still more to find. And then with this in mind, there's still the rest of God to consider. This must drive us to our knees. This must lead us to awe and worship. This ought to shock our self-importance and pride. How could we be proud knowing how vast God is? There is always something further to discover about God, something more to love. We can never reach the point in our Christian world where we have arrived, where we know that we've got enough knowledge, where we know God well enough, where we've reached the destination of knowing God completely. It just can't happen. So if you are someone, and I'm sure that we all are to some degree or another, subject to our own pride and self-importance, we need to spend time gazing upon, contemplating, meditating on this incomprehensibility of God. We need it to crush our pride. Or perhaps you're, you're feeling stagnant in your Christian growth. You're not really going anywhere. You're not really growing in your love. You're not really sure what's going on. You need to spend time gazing upon this immense God. Or perhaps if you're consumed by the world and you are distracted by the, the pleasures that it tells you that it has, you need to stop and you need to look at this immense God and let it crush your awe for the world and let your love for him grow. We need to let God become bigger in our own minds and we need to become smaller. Now, this is magnified because we have a very serious disability when it comes to understanding God. And this disability is our sin nature. Our sin nature affects every part of us, every single faculty, from our bodies to our souls to our mind. With a corrupt mind, we cannot properly understand God. We'll learn something and we will twist it. We'll make it say some, the opposite when we want to. And this is because of the sin in us. And this means that we are something like a, a, a man running a race. But we're in a wheelchair. And it does not matter how well we've trained, how fast we can move, we have a severe disadvantage. We can't run. Somebody running the race will always beat us. But with this said, we have something to look forward to. One day, our corruption will be removed and we'll be able to see God as he truly is, free from the corruption of the mind. Yet, as I mentioned before, even with this corruption gone, God is still incomprehensible. And this is exciting. This is wondrous. This means that we have eternity to look upon God and never, ever lose our wonder. We will never grow tired of looking upon him. So look forward to him with anticipation. Love the appearing of Christ. It will be the most joyous for us. Now, secondly, we see that this is a God who reveals himself. With this in mind, it should amaze us that God has not remained afar off, but has revealed himself to us. We read in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. There are things that will always belong to God, but he has revealed himself to us. He has revealed so this for our, our own benefit. Now, he's only chosen to reveal certain things about himself. There will always be mysteries. There will always remain these deep mysteries of God that we won't understand. This means those complex things, say, say the Trinity or, or the, the doctrine of the hypostatic union, Jesus being truly God and truly man. We cannot truly understand this, but we can rest on the things that he has revealed that this is true without coming to a complete and total understanding of this. 
knowing that he is greater than what we actually know. But God is knowable because he has revealed himself to us. And this was always the intention of God, to be in relation with us. It's being, this is built on being made in the image of God. He created us with the ability to communicate. He comes down to our level. He speaks our language. Back in the garden, God created man. He blessed him and revealed himself to him. He speaks to him, gives him commandments to follow. And in some way, he physically reveals himself to our first parents. God and man from the very beginning were designed to relate, to communicate. Yet, now we, we all know that we don't have this ease of communication. We don't hear his voice. We don't see his person. And this is, again, because of sin. Since Adam disobeyed God, relations between God and man have been strained. God had to be all the more particular in the way that he revealed himself. So, how is it that God does reveal himself? There are two particular ways that God has decided to reveal himself. Firstly, we see him through nature. And this is called general revelation. We see this described in Romans chapter 1, 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. In the very creation, God's fingerprints are everywhere. No one can honestly look outside and not believe that has been created. The beauty of the world points to God's creativity, uh, points to his power and magnitude. The intricacy in the DNA that we have inside us points to his wisdom. When we look at the, scar when we look at the star stars, the size and the magnitude of the universe points to his power. Yet, it is not enough to properly know him, to, to know what he desires, to know what his intentions are. For this, we turn to what is known as special revelation, which today is seen through the scriptures. We see this taught in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is breathed out by God. We have in our hands, often we carry it around in our pockets on our phones. We have so much ease and access to the very words breathed out by God. In these words, we've been shown the very will of God. He's revealed himself clearly, who he is, what he is like, what he has done. We can properly know who God is. He has given to us what he desires for us in our lives. And this means because we have the breathed out words of God, that we can have a true and perfect knowledge of God. Now, I don't mean perfect as in complete, but I mean as in pure and untarnished truth. We can truly know things about God because his revelation is intelligible. It is not irrational. It is not gibberish. It is not nonsense. And this is in spite of our sin nature. The revelation of God is clear. Now we live in a time and place in which we have more resources than ever before. We have the scriptures very, very accurately translated into our own language. They're clear and easy to read. We have so many Bible helps, things to help us to understand the Bible, that we should blush at our own illiteracy. When you look at some of the, the saints of the past and what they knew of God, it's amazing what some of them know. And this is in spite of not having the things that we have. In the past, they did not have this ease. Think about it for a moment. How many Bibles are in this room? How many Bibles are in your house? I'm pretty certain we've all got more than one. 
Ask yourself this. How many Bibles would you have if you had to hand write it out? For most of Christian history, that was the reality. The only way you had a Bible was if you or someone had handwritten it. Think about the cost that would involve. Even when the printing press came out, it was, I mean, how, how cheap can we pick up a Bible today? You can find places where they literally are giving them out for nothing. There's no excuse for not having a Bible. But in the past, it cost people months and months, sometimes a year of pay to purchase a Bible. There are and have been Christians who have protected and died for even a single page of the scriptures because that is what their entire church possessed. What can we take from this? We need to live a life devoted to the scriptures. But this awesome God, immensely powerful and lovely, has clearly revealed himself in them. We don't go to the scriptures because we are Christians. And that's what we're supposed to do. The scriptures are not the end. We, we, we don't worship the scriptures. That's not the point. But they are the means in which we can meet with God, to be amazed with him. Through the scriptures, we can look out at creation and see God's glory through it. And we must be diligent in what has been revealed to us. Richard Baxter puts it this way. Remember that as it is Christ's work to teach, it is yours to hear and read and study, and pray, and practice what you hear. Do your part, then, if you expect the benefit. You come not to the school of Christ to be idle. Knowledge drops not into the sleepy dreamer's mouth. Dig for it as for silver, and search for it in the scriptures as for a hidden treasure. This also is where discipleship becomes critically important. God just doesn't relate to us one-on-one -on -one as an individual, but as a community. How God has always done it, always in a community. And so it is our responsibility to one another to better know what is revealed in the scriptures. We must be discipling one another. It must be just what we are known for doing, spending time together, speaking of the things of God, teaching, growing, and loving one, other, one another through it. Now, this starts from the pulpit, but it must include every single disciple of Christ. You see, we don't need to be uncertain about who God is, who he truly is. God has clearly revealed himself and expects us to seek him. I mean, if we don't believe God has revealed himself, how, how would we act? If we don't treasure and study the scriptures, are we showing that we don't believe that God has revealed himself? If we neglect the words of God in our hands, what are we saying about what we believe? Are we really walking by faith? In this gracious action of revealing himself, he has given us all that we need to know how to please God how to live in this life, what God expects from us. But included in this is how, once again, we can enter into relationship with him. He has revealed his glorious plan of salvation. And this is where we get to knowing God. If we are going to be taking the time to uncover the truths of God's character, we need to be doing it for the purpose of knowing God. But knowing God is not simply knowing that God exists. It's not knowing about him. It is so much more. This morning, we've started to dig into the very character of God. Now, while it is important that we can, to, while it is important to know that we can never fully understand God, and it is important to know that he has revealed himself to us, it is not enough. We need to know God. We need to be in relation with him. 
It is no good knowing the things of God and remaining in the kingdom of darkness. There have been people who've spent their lives studying the attributes of God, studying the Bible, and are extremely knowledgeable on the scriptures, but they do not know God. They are never truly affected by the things that they learn. It has all been in vain. It's the greatest sadness that there could be to spend a life in the scriptures and miss the point. But Yahweh can be known truly, sufficiently, and personally. And this is most important, that we know him personally. He's revealed himself to us so that we can know him, to see his glory, and to magnify his greatness. Now, true knowledge of God can only come through knowing the Son, knowing Jesus Christ. It is not enough to know the truths of God. We can only truly know God through the God-man Jesus. All that God is shines through the lens that is Jesus Christ. He has made him known. See John 1.18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, which is speaking of Jesus, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Only then can we be in relationship with God. This is where it is critical to understand. Knowing God is a relationship. It's not an academic exercise. It isn't like reading a biography. It's developing a relationship. Now, certainly it is a very different and unique relationship to what we are used to having. But that's what it is. Knowing God is what the gospel is really about. We read in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Truly knowing God means that we have eternal life. It is so enriching of a relationship that it is life-filling. This must affect the way that we come to God, how we pray. It affects the ways that we give our prayers of praise and adoration. You can't praise someone you don't know. It's empty and vain otherwise. And as we grow in our knowledge of God, as we grow in our knowledge of Christ, the more we have to praise him. We read in Hebrews 8 verses 11 and 12. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. The gospel is not just that our sins have been removed, as wonderful as that is. It is not just about being able to go to heaven, as glorious as that will be, is, is that we can know God. The true knowledge of God shines into the heart of the gospel. My brothers and sisters, this ought to lead us to a deep peace, a comfort that knowing God brings such love. That before a holy and righteous God, our sin is no more. And knowing God only comes through knowing Christ through faith. Bartholomew Ashwood puts it this way. True faith carries knowledge with it. Faith is not hoodwinked and blind, but has, but has his discerning. By faith, we come to understand. Hence, the gospel is to be preached to every creature. What is the gospel? but the opening of Jesus Christ, his sufficiency and willingness to save sinners. While a person's lie in a state of ignorance, they cannot come to a true title to Jesus Christ. Further, knowing God, truly knowing God is transformative. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, we read, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 
anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. True knowledge of God is experiential. Again, it's not an academic exercise. It changes us. You see, we reflect those who we spend time with. Your mannerisms change. The words you use change. The things that you say, the things that you like, the things that you dislike are impacted by those who you spend time with. We display love because God is love and we are reflecting God. That is how we know him. That is how we know that we know him. Now, you must seek him. Seek him, my brothers and sisters. It is in him we will find rest. In him we will find true satisfaction. Through faith we can behold the glory of Christ and know God. Now, to anybody who may be sitting in this room who does not know God, I tell you now, you are in dire peril. If knowing God brings eternal life, not knowing God is eternal death. Your greatest need is that you know God, that you are known by God. And the only place that you can find him is in Christ. And know that he can be truly, clearly, and sufficiently known. You see, if you are not known by God, your sin will remain upon you. And God, who cannot tolerate sin, will condemn you. There is no way out. You will be missing on the greatest treasure there ever is, knowing God. And you will find yourself in eternal condemnation. So come to Christ and trust in his perfect sacrifice to take away your sins. It is there you will find a perfect and sufficient Savior. Friends, if you do not know Christ, seek him. Seek him today. To conclude, this morning we have taken the first steps in our journey to know the Lord better. We have barely scratched the surface in understanding that God is magnificently great and incomprehensibly large, that we could never come to fully understand him, yet he has revealed himself to us. It is my hope over the next number of sermons that we can grow together in the knowledge of God, that we are pushed deeper into the love of God and to the love of his word, that we can grow in our understanding of our greatest treasure. We can find true satisfaction in God because he is the eternal one. We can find true satisfaction in Christ because there is no end of him. You must ask yourself, is this the God that I serve? Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself that even though we have sinned before you, you've come down to us and shown us who you are in your word. We praise you for your greatness, for the unsearchable riches of your wisdom and your glory. For yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty and all that is in the heavens and in the earth are yours. Yours is the kingdom, O God, and you are exalted above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hands are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. And we thank you, our God, and we praise your glorious, holy name together. Amen.